Hi everybody, I'm so excited because today we are going to be hosting a Christmas banquet with 45 men who have come out of prison and gone through a recovery program. Today's message is, you are not forgotten. Stay tuned. So tonight is really just a time to celebrate what God has done in all of our lives, right? We come together as brothers and sisters and we can celebrate and we may all have different stories. We all have different backgrounds, but we all can agree we're all sinners, right? All of us have fallen short somewhere. Hopefully we don't know everywhere that we've all been, but everybody's fallen short. So that puts us all on an even plane in here, right? I was not in a planned pregnancy when I was conceived. So the lady that had me didn't want me. So I was in an unplanned, unplanned pregnancy. She was kind enough and I'm very grateful that she carried me for nine months because how many of us know that today's time there's a lot of abortions. So I'm very grateful that I'm a 51 year old living, breathing person standing here before you. Amen. Very grateful. And let me just say, abortions, there's hope for people that have had that. But I'm very grateful uh, that the person that had me chose to carry me for nine months. So she must have had love in her, right? Or I wouldn't be standing here. So I'm very grateful. I've never met her. I really do not have a desire to meet her. I just feel content with my mom and dad. But at my birth, um, she, she abandoned me and gave me up. And so I didn't have anywhere to go. I was orphaned. And I was turned over to the government services and I was put in foster care for three and a half months. And I know nothing about the foster care that I was in. I know nothing about my first three and a half months of my life. But God knows. And God had a plan. And so I was adopted at three and a half months old into a loving family. My mother couldn't have children because she'd had a hysterectomy shortly after her and my father married. And so they adopted my older brother, who's two years older, and then me. And then seven years later, they adopted my little brother. My little brother is part black, part Indian, so I like to say we're the Oreo cookie in reverse family. <laughs> so we're the Oreo cookie family in reverse. But being in a family with, in a small town in Oklahoma, from different ethnicities and a multicultural family, I got to see firsthand what racial discrimination is. It's horribly sad. Things that I saw as a child for my little brother, I would not want for anybody. Because we're all created in God's image, and like I said, we're all sinners, we're all equal under God. He created every one of us. So it makes us all very important. It doesn't matter the color of our skin. So I learned from a very young age, from the Lord, unusually, that he loved me. I learned that. My parents loved me. God loved me. And so I knew that God was love. And so I was content in the Lord. I learned that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. In fact, scripture says that in all these things, we are conquerors through him who loved us. And I'm convinced. Are you convinced? that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. So Jesus entered Jericho and he was passing through Jericho. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree. And since Jesus was coming that way, 
He wanted to see him, and when Jesus reached the spot, Jesus looked at him. Now remember, Zacchaeus had never met him, and Jesus looked at him, and he said, Zacchaeus, he knew him by name. He said, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. So he came down at once, and he welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this, and they began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Scandalous. Can you imagine? So we know Zacchaeus is a sinner. That puts me there. That puts you there, right? But Jesus saw him, and he knew him by name. And it's scandalous because Jesus is going to go stay with a sinner. And we see Zacchaeus being the tax collector. It goes on to say, he stood up and he said, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. You see, he is the God of possibilities. He saw Zacchaeus who, if Zacchaeus is going back to try to figure out who he needs to pay four times for who he cheated, that means Zacchaeus was a cheater, right? Jesus was interested in the cheater. Then he saw the woman who was caught in adultery. Heaven forbid he had anything to do with a woman caught in adultery, right? I mean, in those times and days, you would get stoned to death if you were caught in adultery, so surely Jesus isn't going to talk to her, right? But Jesus seems to do the opposite of what everybody else thinks he should do, and he definitely doesn't follow the religious leaders of their time. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're so sad you see. <laughs> so Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law, the Pharisees, brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. Teacher, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman is caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it commanded us to stone such women. They were repeating the law. Now what do you say? They were trying to use this question to trap Jesus in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down next to the woman caught in adultery and he started writing. It doesn't tell us in scripture what he wrote, but can you use your imagination? If the woman caught in adultery is watching, he probably wrote, you are loved. He may have written, you are forgiven. What do you suppose Jesus wrote to her? Think about that. I always wonder, I wish we knew what Jesus wrote to her, but it had to have been good. He may have said, you're chosen. We don't know what he said. Jesus straightened up. He looked at him and he said, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. All those Pharisees and the Sadducees couldn't do it because they were all on the same boat as the woman. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground again. Oh, I wish I knew what that said. Maybe when we get to heaven, we'll know. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And they'd all left. And she said, well, no one, sir. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. You see, the woman caught in adultery saw Jesus give her possibilities. And that's me. And that's you. He said, go and sin no more. That's the theme of his ministry. He tells them, I'll take in the sinners. I'll take them all. And then I'll put my name on their heart. And then I'll send him out and tell him to sin no more because I'm the Jesus of possibilities. The woman at the well, 
I love the woman at the well because Jesus was a Jew and she was a Samaritan woman. Now, it didn't matter, female or male, Jews and Samaritans weren't supposed to talk. So, not only is she from Samaria, but she's female. And in their culture and time, they were a little less than men, unfortunately. God created us all. I don't really understand anybody being less than anybody because we're all created in the image of God, right? So she understood somehow, Scripture doesn't tell us how they identified that she was a Samaritan and he was a Jew. I mean, he was in Samaria, so that would kind of qualify her being at the well, but he was at the well too. I often wonder, how did they know they were different? Maybe by their language, you know, by their accent, or maybe by the way they dressed. We don't know how, or maybe Scripture doesn't tell us, maybe they communicated where they were from. We don't know. But they start talking. And she says to him, or he says to her, will you give me a drink? So gently and kindly. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because she knew the rules. You know, there's always rules, right? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, the gift of God, those possibilities for all of us, the gift that God gives all of us, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Amen. I've received living water. Have you received living water? Amen. Is it the greatest living water ever? Amen. It's living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? She recognizes it's something different, something unique, something she wants. And so she says, where can I get it? Everyone who drinks from this physical water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal, eternal life. I had to remind myself of that because there's been times in my life where I've gone through depression and I have to remind myself that I have living water. Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves that we have living water, don't we? And I have found the key for me to get out of any kind of depression or any kind of mind that, you know, the enemy wants to take our mind. That's the number one thing the enemy wants to try to get is your mind. Have you learned that? He wants your mind because if he can get your mind, he'll get your heart. If he can get your heart, he'll get your actions, right? It starts in your mind. So what do we need to do to combat our mind? I learned, and hopefully you've learned, what you need to do to combat that. The Word. God's Word is the key. If your mind starts getting under attack, you get into your Word and you start reading the Word out loud. And then you tell the enemy, get thee behind me, Satan. He has no place or authority in our life because we have what? What do we have? Living water, right? We have the living water. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, right? So Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. He starts reading her mail because he said, go call your husband. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You don't have a husband. And he starts prophesying to her. He says, you don't have a husband right now. You're living with someone, but you've had five husbands. That makes her unworthy, right? According to the world. No, not to Jesus. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. <laughs> He's more than a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers... How many of you are true worshipers? Come on, let me hear it. How many are true worshipers? All right, that's a little better. One more time. How many is true worshipers? They'll worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. He's telling this to the woman caught in adultery. She didn't seem like a truthful worshiper, did she? But he saw what was her potential, and he was the God of possibilities. And God is spirit, 
and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ. She still hadn't caught on who he was exactly. Is coming. I know he's coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared to her, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. Heaven forbid, more scandals, right? Can you see the people off, you know, Jesus, that person is talking to a woman. Scandalous. He broke all the rules. He went past all the barriers of what was normal during their day. And he did what was spiritual. And then she went out and she told people in the community, come see who this man was that just read my mail and gave me living water. So she goes and spreads the good news and she's an evangelist. She goes and tells the city. And that woman found out that Jesus was the God of possibilities. He was Jesus in flesh, God in flesh. He had possibilities for her, the sinner, the one that he came to. And she was not forgotten, was she? He didn't forget her, did he? Mary Magdalene was full of seven demons. Heaven forbid. But she was not forgotten in Jesus' mind. He saw her. And according to scripture in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, it says, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. I love this part right here where he said, cured of evil spirits and diseases. Because that includes me too, because I had a brain tumor about 25 years ago, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor that God healed supernaturally. So can we give God glory for healing? We serve a God of possibilities. There is nothing impossible with God. That woman followed Jesus and began to follow his ministry. She, she had to have some kind of money because according to scripture, she gave to his ministry and would follow him. So I've been in Israel and there's a place called Magdala. So they think she was from Magdala. I went with AGTS over there on a scholarship study trip. And so she was probably a, a businesswoman who could support his ministry, but she was about Jesus. He cast the demons out and she followed him. She loved him. He had living water for her. She wanted to go hear his teaching. She wanted to learn from him. And so she followed him. Can you imagine someone like that? You follow, you receive, you learn you have possibilities. But then she starts seeing Jesus be accused. She starts seeing Jesus being beaten and mocked. Jesus was in prison for doing nothing wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't deserve to go to prison. He didn't deserve to get the crown of thorns placed on his head. You know, they were mocking him when they put the crown on his head because he said he was the king of the Jews. So they made him a crown to make fun of him. And they placed that crown of thorns on his head and then they jabbed it in his skull as hard as they could because, you know, he says he's the king of the Jews, so they're going to make fun of him. Here she sees them take Jesus and do all these horrible stuff to him to the point they take him to the cross and they take the nails and they drive him into his hands, the perfect lamb, spotless, no sin. All he wanted to do was good for people. Jesus went to the cross and Mary followed that man all the way to the cross. She saw him die on the cross. She saw when they poked the spear in his side. She saw when it all went black and, you know, all the thunder and you hear in scripture. I mean, she was there. She was there. She saw all of it. She saw the mistreatment. She saw him say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Then Mary decided she'd go to the tomb. She loved him so much. She wanted to go see him at the tomb, you know, just be close to where he was. So she'd go to the tomb, and one day she went to the tomb, and it was opened. So Mary, according to scripture, when the stone was rolled away and opened, she peeks inside, crying. She, re she looked in there thinking, someone stole him, right? That's what she, I mean, what would you think? 
Someone stole, not only did they kill him, and he didn't deserve it, but now they've stole his body. So she's crying. And when she looked in there, there's two angels, according to scripture, that are in white. One at the head and one at the tail. She turns around and she sees Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him. She thought it was a gardener. So she says to the gardener, when he asked her why she, why she is crying, she's upset. She's explaining to the gardener. Did, she asked him, according to scripture, did you take the body? Because she thinks, okay, why are you here, right? Not knowing it was Jesus. He looked her in the eye and he said, Mary. And when he said that, she knew it was Jesus. He calls us by name, doesn't he? She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them. Tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. You know, my Father, he says, and my God is your Father and your God. And Mary Magdalene, according to Scripture, she went back and she told the disciples the good news and told them, I have seen the Lord. So she evangelized another evangelist, another female evangelist. Can you imagine? Scandalous during their time. God did not forget Mary Magdalene. Do you know who God went to first? Who Jesus appeared to first? Mary Magdalene, the one who was demon-possessed. Why would Jesus do that? Why do you think Jesus did that? I think he did it to show the entire world. I mean, if you're possessed with seven demons, don't show it. Raise, raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. That's pretty bad. Have you ever been possessed with seven demons? I mean, seven demons. He loved her and saw her, and he said, I have possibilities for you. One encounter with Jesus changed everything. How much worth God has for all of us. He has so much worth for you. He has so much worth for me. He says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head, and I know some of you have more than others, but he says, don't be afraid. You are worth more than sparrows, according to Luke chapter 12. There was a man at McDonald's. He went to McDonald's, true story. He went to McDonald's because he thought, and I know this is a sensitive subject, but I feel led by the Lord to share it. He went to McDonald's because he thought, I'm going to go to McDonald's and I'm going to eat my last meal and then I'm going to take my life because life is worthless. I've had nothing but trouble, nothing but problems, and I'm done. So he went to McDonald's. He got his McDonald's order. He went and sat down, and after he was going to leave McDonald's, that was going to be it. He was not a Christian. He started eating his sandwich. And he had his french fries with his ketchup. He said, God, if you're real, have someone come and dip their french fry in my ketchup. <laughs> I know, doesn't that just seem ridiculous? True story. A man on the other side of McDonald's was sitting there, a Christian, filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit put on his heart. Go over to that man and dip your french fry in his ketchup. Now, can you imagine God telling you such a crazy thing? <laughs> Go dip your french fry in his ketchup? I'd be like, God, is this really you? So you can imagine what he was going through. Is this really God? Right? Wouldn't you say that? God, are you really telling? But he obeyed. He obeyed. He knew it was the Holy Spirit. He trusted it was the Holy Spirit. And what did he have to lose, right? If the Holy Spirit leads you to do something, do it. That's why I'm here tonight. The Holy Spirit led me here. Amen. And the guy walked over to him and he, you know, can you imagine a stranger? And he got down to him and he said, Sir, I know this sounds completely crazy, 
but I feel like the Lord is asking me to bring my french fry <laughs> over here and ask you if I can dip my french fry in your ketchup. And the guy just starts bawling. And the guy got saved. And God saved his life. And he's the God of possibilities, isn't he? You are worth everything to God, more than birds. He feeds them. Think how much more he says he loves you. When you see birds, think he feeds them. He's going to feed me, right? So do we need to fear or worry? He tells us not to, to be anxious for nothing. We need to trust him, right? He fed me. You know there's no peace in the world. You are not going to find peace in the world. If you even think you are, it's just not going to happen. That's why he's the Prince of Peace. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid, according to John 14, verse 27. And Christmas time, right? For unto us a child is born, for unto us a child is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, according to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. You see, God did not forget these people. He didn't forget me. He didn't forget Zacchaeus, the cheater. He didn't forget the adulterous woman at the well. He didn't forget the demon-possessed Mary Magdalene. Heaven forbid, right? Seven demons. He loved her. And Jesus does not forget you, does he? Praise the Lord. Thank you for having me. God bless you. Here at Dr. Marla Ministries, we exist to inform you, encourage you, inspire you, and motivate you to draw closer to the Lord. And so we want to offer something to you that you can take home and listen to messages and draw closer to the Lord and to His Word. We've got a four-part teaching series about overcoming your giants. I think everybody in life has giants. So what can you do to overcome and be empowered by the Lord to overcome those giants? The four-part teaching will be defeat your giants, overcome your giants, become a victorious warrior, and inquire of the Lord to defeat your giants. You know, with God, all things are possible. So if you think you have a giant that you can't overcome, these messages are for you. You can get these easily on my website. Go to drmarla.org. You can order those there. They're only $30, and that $30 will help us take the gospel around the world, and we'll mail those to you free of charge. We want to see God work in your life. That's what we stand for, is helping you be transformed through the power of God. So you want to overcome those giants? You want to see impossibilities become possible? Get this four-part teaching today, and this is going to transform your life through the power of God.